Are my slides uh, visible, ma'am? Yes, yes. yes. So, so, good evening, everyone. Uh, I thank Team AIOS for giving me this honor of uh, presenting my experience in the armed forces in retinal diseases. So, I'll be sharing my experience in the use of transfovial 532 nanometers sub threshold micropulse laser in non resolving CSCR with subfovial leaks. So traditionally, we've been classifying CSCR simply based on the chronology, based on the duration of the disease, taking three months or four months as the cutoff limit to, dis to classify it as an acute or chronic form of the disease. So the rules at all for the first time suggested that acute CSCR, when it crosses the time duration of three months or four months, but has not developed that peculiar diffuse retinal pigment epithelopathy, it's inappropriate to call it chronic CSCR. So it would be more appropriate to call these cases as cases of persistent or non-resolving CSCR. So we all know that once the photoreceptors stay disengaged from the underlying RP for a period of uh, more than three months or four months, that's the time when the photoreceptors start undergoing a permanent and irreversible damage. So that's the very basic reason why we go for an intervention once the condition doesn't resolve within a period of three months or so. So uh, I did my initial work at LVP as a fellow under uh, Dr. Jay Shablani. So we first wanted to answer this study question, whether if we go for an early la uh, laser in all cases of CSR, is it going to make any difference quantitatively if we can quantify if it's going to make any difference functionally uh, in the vision of the patient? So we did an RCT on uh, 60 eyes, all of them having CSR for a duration of less than two months. So in one arm, we did an early laser, the other arm, we did sham laser. So what we found was that there was no change, no difference in the speed of recovery, and there was no difference in the final visual outcome. So one question was answered that there, it is not advisable to go for an early laser in these cases. So the next question which I wanted to answer is, what do we do when these eyes have crossed that time of three months, but the FFA shows a leak, which is subfovial in location? So yes, uh, we all know that conventional laser is not an option in these cases. Yes, PDT is the option. Now, uh, specifically, the advantage being, in the, uh, being that it's targeting the choroid, which is the primary site of pathology uh, in these cases. But then come to think of it, how many Indians can afford PDT? Then uh, the, the complexity of the procedure, the availability of equipment, the dye, the strict uh, post-procedure precautions which the patient is supposed to take. So keeping all these limitations in mind, the next option available with us is sub-threshold micropulse laser. So when we talk of this laser in CSCR, there are quite a few studies which have been done in CSCR using sub-threshold micropulse laser. But most of these studies are not specifically targeting the subfovial location. Most of them are excluding the FAZ. So when we talk of the initial studies, most of those studies were on 810 nanometers diode laser. Now we know that the advantage of this laser is that it's got a longer wavelength, so the penetration is going to be deeper, lowering of damage, collateral damage to the inner retinal layers. So, uh, yes, that is very well understood. The Later, with the advent of 577 nanometers yellow laser, uh, there were more studies, uh, and the very logic was that 577 nanometers yellow laser is minimally absorbed by the xanthophyll pigment of the macula. So it has to be safer in any location near the fovea. So out of these studies, uh, ours was the first study which specifically uh, used 577 nanometer, uh, nanometer yellow laser in the foveal location, transfovially. So this was a study, a uh, pilot study on 10 eyes having subfovial leaks. And what we found was that all the eyes showed improvement in the form of increase in the retinal sensitivity. There was absorption of uh, resolution of subretinal fluid, except that one eye needed rescue laser at the end of three months. So with this background, so what I felt was that in our centers, we do not have yellow laser, which is available with us. So I wanted to experiment with 532 nanometers laser, which is the most commonly available laser with retinal surgeons, at least in our arm forces centers. So if I use this laser, what parameters should I use if I want to use it transfovally? So again, I went back to the studies. So it's basically two wavelengths which people have used till date. So when we talk of diode laser, 810 nanometers, we, use, we, uh, we see that the power which they have used is in the higher range. It ranges from 500 to 1800 milliwatts. Now that can be explained again by the longer wavelength since the penetration is deeper. Show its effect at the level of RP, we would, leave, uh, we would need a comparatively higher energy. When we talk of yellow laser, 
most of these uh, studies have used 30% to 50% of the threshold power. In our study, which was the study which used transferable laser, we used 30% of the threshold power. So when I talk, uh, uh, when I think of green laser, 532 nanometers, the wavelength is still lower than 577 nanometers. Uh, so I expect it to be having a lesser penetration. I expect it to cause a little more collateral damage as compared to yellow laser. So what I decided was to bring the power to even a lower setting. I decreased it to 20% uh, of the threshold power. So it was a prospective interventional study done on uh, individuals more than 18 years of age who were symptomatic for more than three months and showing some foveal leaks on FFA. We excluded patients with chronic CICR. We excluded patients having multiple leaks on FFA and patients having current or part history of uh, steroid use. The primary outcome measure was change in the best corrected visual acuity and a change in the contrast sensitivity. Secondary outcome measures were the uh, to check for resolution of the neurosensory detachment and to look for any adverse effects of laser. We had an option of rescue laser at the end of three months if the patient did not show resolution or even a trend towards resolution of the settings as we used in the primary laser treatment. So this was the setting. We used 5% duty cycle. We used a pulse duration of 200 milliseconds. So a 100 micron uh, spot size with area centralis was used uh, to impart a burn, a just visible burn outside the vascular arcade. Further, the power was now brought down to 20% of this threshold power. So I used a grid of 5 by 5 spots which were confluent in nature with zero spacing between them right over the area of leakage seen on FFA. So this is just a representative case showing subretinal fluid. This is the leak, the site of leakage, which is exactly sufferable in location. Uh, this is the pre-laser OCT and this is one month post-laser. So we do not uh, see any disruption in the RP or in the ellipsoid zone or in the ELM in this OCT. This is the autofluorescence before laser. This is the autofluorescence after laser. There are a few RP changes, but they are the pre-existing ones. There are no fresh RP changes seen on autofluorescence. These are a few other examples of uh, eyes having subfoveal leaks. And these are the OCT scans, again, of a few representative cases. The ones on the left side are pre-laser. The ones on the right are post-laser. I want you to pay attention to the one which is in the bottom left corner. Now, these are very typical cases. Some cases of CSCR, they just persist. Uh, having a very small pocket of subfoveal fluid. Now, thinking of it, some people would just uh, treat them conservatively with observation. But if you, we leave the subfoveal fluid for long duration, the photoreceptors are going to continuously uh, get damaged. and It's going to cause a uh, progressive loss of vision in all these cases. So when I did micropulse, within a month, you see that the retina is absolutely flat. There is some disruption which was pre-existing in the RP and ellipsoid zone. So that means the eye was going into chronicity. So it's worth uh, trying micropulse laser in these cases, having even small pockets of subfoveal fluid. This is again another case uh, in which I want to show one particular feature. Now, this is a typical case where the uh, dome-shaped serous PD is right in the subfoveal location, large amount of subretinal fluid. So one month post laser, we see that the PD has started to flatten. The subretinal fluid has uh, reduced. And two months post-op, uh, we see that uh, a minimal amount of fluid is left. Now, three months post uh, laser, uh, the macula was totally dry. Unfortunately, we lost the data in the OCT machine, so I do not have that uh, image to show you. But three months post op, it was a dry macula. So ultimately, we had 23 eyes of 21 males uh, having CSCR for a duration of around four and a half months. The laser power which I used ranged from 140 to 240 milliwatts uh, energy. So uh, as we followed up these cases, uh, there was a progressive improvement in vision uh, right from the baseline and there was an improvement in the contrast sensitivity from baseline to six months and uh, there was a res progressive resolution of subretinal fluid and as expected uh, normalization of central macular thickness progressively uh, during the follow-up. So when we see the, uh, the proportion of uh, the eyes which showed complete resolution of fluid it was 40 percent at the end of one month 52% at the end of three months and 70% at the end of uh, six months. Now, the figures are not uh, very appealing, but then these are eyes which have not shown any response. 
which have not shown any signs of resolution for the past three or four months, even four plus months. So uh, a complete resolution of fluid at the end of, in 40% of the eyes at the end of one month cannot be by chance. So that means they all responded to this uh, treatment protocol. Uh, this is a list of the 23 eyes. You see that at the end of the six uh, of six months, most of the eyes have resolved, uh, except two of these eyes, which needed rescue laser at the end of three months, but still did not show any response. So ultimately, they responded to PDT at the end of six months. Another two eyes, which initially had a very good response after the micropulse laser, again started showing a recurrence of fluid at the end of six months, for which they were treated with rescue laser at six months, to which they both responded. So, uh, as far as safety concerns uh, on SDOCT or on fundus uh, autofluorescence, none of the patients had any procedure-related complications. So, to conclude, transfoveal 532 nanometers subthreshold micropulse laser is safe and effective in non-resolving CSE with subfoveal leaks. Now, uh, we should keep in mind that uh, repeat micropulse laser may be required if if cases show recurrence, but then the advantage of the procedure is since it's sub threshold in, in the energy level, we can keep repeating this procedure as long as we are sure that it's going to benefit the patient. Thank you.